Welcome, Roomers and Zoomers, to Orange Coast Unitarian Universalist Church. My name is Jan Maybe, and I am your worship associate today. I am joined by Reverend Sean Wilshire, our minister, and Beth Syverson, our director of music ministries, in welcoming you this morning. Karen Magoon Pearson, our director of religious education, is currently holding classes for our children at Estancia Park. We would also like to thank all the wonderful volunteers behind the scenes who made today's service possible. We also respectfully recognize that our church property rests on a Hachiman and Tangba land. As Unitarian Universalists, we have many different beliefs, but we are one loving community. Together, we covenant that whatever our beliefs, we accept one another and encourage each other in spiritual growth. We affirm that all life has inherent value and that all existence is interconnected. We strive for justice and compassion in our deeds and relationships, and we are committed to creating a welcoming community without regard to the traits that sometimes divide people. To our rumors, we invite you to silence your cell phones. For our Zoomers, we invite you to say hello in the chat. Because of our current circumstances, when songs appear on the screen, rumors are invited to sway with the music, while Zoomers can, of course, sing along. I wanted to extend a special warm and welcome to visitors. If you are seeking a spiritual home, we hope that you will find it here. Later in the service, we will have an opportunity for you to introduce yourself if you'd like to do so. Let our worship begin with the lighting of our chalice as we say our unison affirmation. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its call to dwell together in peace, to seek truth in love, and to help one another, this we affirm together. Good morning, everyone. We're going to start with a, a fun song to open us up. I invite everyone, Zoomers and Roomers, to stand in body or spirit, and uh, we're going to teach you some actions that go along with this song. So it's whoever you are, we welcome you. Wherever you come from, we welcome you. Whomever you love, we welcome you. really hard time not singing to that song. Yeah. I'd like to invite Reverend Liz and Reverend Judy up here to join me. These are our two new affiliated ministers. We're going to meet them more in a moment. Ah, you who are broken hearted, who woke today with the winds of despair whistling through your mind, you're welcome here. You who are wounded, limping through life, hurting with every step, you are welcome here. You who are fearful, who live with shadows, 
covering over your shoulders. You are welcome here. This place is a sanctuary and it is for you. You who are filled with happiness, whose abundance overflows, you are welcome here. You who walk through the world with lightness and grace, you who have strength and hope, you who have everything to give, you are welcome here. This place is your calling, a river bank to channel the sweet waters of your life. This place where you are called by the world's need, we offer love. Here we receive in gratitude. Here we make a circle from the great gifts of breath, attention, and purpose. You are all welcome here. So just so you're inviting Nancy Lockery, who was the president of our congregation here, to join us. She was going to be here in person, but uh, had, wasn't feeling really well this morning, but really wanted to be here. So she's here modeling self-care on Zoom. <laughs> so uh, we'll spotlight her for a moment. Take it away, Nancy. It is with great joy that the board has voted to recognize and affirm two new affiliated ministers to our congregation. An affiliated minister is not a parish minister like Reverend Sean, but one that mostly serves the larger community beyond our church. We have had affiliated ministers in the past. As affiliated ministers, they will work with Reverend Sean to provide some volunteer work, but they also will represent us out in the larger community as their time allows. They will work with Reverend Sean to provide some programming and or preaching. In return, we offer them our support and affiliation. 
Most of you know Reverend Judy Tomlinson. She comes to us with 38 years experience serving our congregations, 20 of which was as an ordained minister. In fact, she started her road to ministry as our Director of Religious Education here at OCUUC. She went on to serve one of the largest churches in New Jersey before deciding to come back here to retire. Only ministry wasn't done with her. She served our Long Beach Church as they dealt with a difficult transition in their ministry. And then when an opening for Director of Religious Education came open here, she served this church for over three years. Having decided to retire officially, she is still not done with ministry. She asked and was joyfully offered to be an affiliated minister with our congregation. Reverend Liz Mur Murphy is at the other end of her career. She is just starting it. Many of you may or may not know her well as Reverend Liz Murphy. She has preached here twice, but what you may not know is that Reverend Sean has been her vocational advisor for the last year. She served as the interim minister at Troop Church and has been ordained this summer. Her ministry will be working as a chaplain at the VA hospital. We are delighted she would like to affiliate with us and like Reverend Judy was joyfully affirmed to be an affiliated minister with OCUUC. I know that as Unitarian Universalist, yay, Michael, yay. <laughs> So, you know, we have this tradition of congregational governance, which means, which means that each congregation exercises the right and responsibility of self-governance. Uh, today, we gather to affirm these two wonderful ministers whose energy is focused not within the walls, but beyond them. And while we do not have a lot of dogma or rules, we have what we call a covenant. These are promises that we make to one another. So this morning, I invite you, rumors and Zoomers, uh, in the spirit of our right and responsibility of self-governance to speak, witness, and affirm a covenant, that promise, with our affiliated ministers. So members and friends, do you agree to recognize and affirm these two affiliated ministers? All right, waiting for a thumbs up also on Zoom. Let's see here, all right, do we, do we affirm? Yes, we all got thumbs up? Excellent, all right then please join me in speaking this covenant together. We pledge to respect your ministry as an extension of our congregation's outreach to make known the principles and values of our Unitarian Universalist faith in the broader community. We pledge our understanding that you are not our settled minister, but rather one whose professional ministry takes place largely outside our church. We pledge our support and appreciation of your ministry and of your volunteer service within this church. Reverend Judy and Reverend Liz. We, we are, are grateful for your, your recognition, recognition, support, and, and affirmation of our ministries. We pledge that we will work with Reverend Sean to find ways of supporting this congregation as we can and are called. We pledge that we will responsibly represent this congregation, bringing the spirit of this church and our Unitarian Universalist faith into our ministry in the larger community. All right, everyone. We joyfully, joyfully affirm, affirm this covenant, covenant of, of affiliation. affiliation. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> All right, with these words, we officially recognize these two new relationships. This is a day of celebration for ministry, for our church, for Reverend Judy, for Reverend Liz. And of course, that means there's cake after the service. So let us sing or sway to this welcoming song.
So this month of October is all about cultivating relationships, the different relationships we have in our life. And so I have some big news to share with you all. Uh, I am in a kind of new relationship since about February. And no, it's not that kind of relationship. <laughs> it is not a romantic one. <laughs> Uh, but I, I want to tell you about it because it's a, a relationship that's incredibly important to me. So many of you know I'm an identical twin and uh, that she has a child, my, the only one of my siblings that has children. Um, and some of you have even met this child. Absolutely one they've come on Christmas Eve and has been a part of the service even and things like that. Now you might be wondering why am I not saying this is my nephew? It's because it turns out I don't have a nephew, I have a niece. Yeah, like wow, I found this out in February. It turns out I've always had a niece, who knew? So. I finally, this summer, when I went up to visit uh, her and, and the whole family up there uh, this summer, she gave me permission to tell you all. So now I have her permission to do this. She's starting a new high school. Uh, she's come out now to the whole family and her, all of her friends and everyone. So because we're talking about cultivating relationships this month, I wanted to give you some ideas of some things that I've learned about this relationship. This is new. I don't have anybody else in my family who is trans. Uh, and I just want to note also that this is a sermon from a cisgendered point of view, right? Cisgendered, if you remember that word, cisgender means my outsides match my inside. It's sort of the, the opposite of trans in a sense. So we're talking about I'm a cisgendered person, she's a transgendered person. So we do have and always give voice to people of a transgender here, um, and we will continue to do so, but I just wanted to speak from my own experience today. So there's four things, basically, that I've learned about cultivating a relationship with my niece, Alex. So the, the first is um, that boy, it's after 15 years of calling her one name and using one pronoun, it is hard to transition, but let me tell you, it gets much easier. It really does. It gets much, much easier. And it's something that, you know, I love her so much that um, I really don't want to do what's called dead naming, right? So that's when you use someone's old name, right? Um, that they no longer claim. And, Claiming a new name for a transgender person is a, is a huge rite of passage, right? It's a claiming of their own identity. And so it can be very uncomfortable and hurtful if you use the wrong name. And of course, I don't want to hurt my niece at all. So uh, I try very hard not to. Um, her name, by the way, is Alex. That's the name she's chosen. It's spelled A-L-A-X, just so you know. Now, uh, there's kind of a fun game that we play actually in the family. Her, her best friend James came up with this, which I thought was kind of fun. Uh, my uh, older sister, uh, my, my twin sister, sorry, uh, accidentally uh, dead named uh, Alex. And James was there and he said, ah, oh, you should give her 25 cents every time you do that. Now, Alex didn't ask for this or anything like that, but Regan was like, hey, that'll be helpful. Yeah, that's what I'll do. So we have this game that uh, if we uh, accidentally dead name or use the wrong uh, pronoun, that we uh, give her 25 cents. Uh, and I am proud to say that for the entire summer that I was there, I only owed her a buck 50. So um, <laughs> uh, I've gotten really good at it. If I accidentally dead name or use the wrong pronoun, tell me because I do this as an honor system. If I do it talking to people, I note the 25 cents and I will send her a check if I need to. So um, at any rate, so that's one of the things. That also, I found myself, um, and, and also, you know, her, her mom and dad who were incredibly supportive, right? Uh, we all felt like every time we would do it wrong, we would beat ourselves up like, oh, man, uh, you know. So forgiveness of yourself is really important. Alex is really cool about it. She's like, there, you know. Um, anytime we would do it wrong, she'd just sort of lean over and go, Alex. I'm like, oh, okay. So uh, at any rate, so if that ever happens, you just say, oops, sorry, and then move on. All right, let's see here. The other thing that I learned is that uh, in many ways, she really hasn't changed. Like, I know that sounds like a sort of a little duh, but I guess when you think of trans, you think of there's big transformation that there's this, but she still wants to be a computer programmer. She's still a geek, loves to play computer games and, Dungeons and Dragons, and she's in the drama club. That didn't change. Um, she's, you know, experimenting with different things with clothes. But you know, her role models—we're not frilly 
like her mom and I were just, you know, we don't wear a lot of makeup or anything. So the, she's just not all that interested in all of those in all of those things. She is just much happier. That's the biggest change I've seen in her because she has something that for a long time we didn't know what it was. It was called gender dysmorphia. And any time we went out into public, she would feel very anxious. And gender dysmorphia basically is when um, people relate to you in a, in a way that your gender, is, you don't feel is right. So she would feel very anxious going out in any public situation and now she's a lot more comfortable with that. So, uh, like I said, she didn't do anything all that, you know, girly, except for she did shave her legs, to which I was like, no, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Can I get an amen, women? Like, why did we ever do this? <laughs> but she did. I was like, all right, she'll have to live with that. All right. Um, so, at any rate, one of the things I guess I want to point out is that, also, is that, you know, relationships really matter. Now, I've been in support of trans rights for 15, 20 years. I actually first heard about them in a UU church. And, um, and I know people, I know people in this congregation who are trans and, and I love them and I want to support them and everything. But let me tell you, now it's personal. Now my mama bear is coming out. Let me tell you, you're going to stand between me and my niece? Oh, watch out. It is personal now. Because relationships matter. They really do. So I invite people to be in relationship with people that are different from ourselves. It matters. The other thing I learned is that having support means everything, right? Having a supportive place. Now, her parents are awesome. Like, they're like, I was a little bit worried about Louis, my brother-in-law. Like, I didn't know how he'd feel. And, and he's like, she's my child. Like, I, you know, doesn't matter to him. To, you know, um, she's in Washington State in a school district that's incredibly supportive the children's hospital there has an entire program. They've been coaching about, you know, you, it goes at, at their pace, like this is how you do it. Like, it's all been really good. Um, she started high school and came out fully to her class this fall. And um, that's been going really well and straightforward. Um, she's really kind of chill about it all in many ways. I mean, it's still scary though, right? When she came out to her parents, it was still scary. And back in February when she did this, you know, her mom said, well, you know, who would you like, uh, who can we tell, you know, to talk about this? And she said, well, you can, you can tell Auntie Sean. Yeah, but she took her months and months to come out to anybody else in the family. Um, uh, I think she actually come out to some of her friends before, and that happens right, you know, and that's okay. It's a scary thing. So creating safe places for people to explore who they are is just really important. Everybody deserves that, to be fully who they are. Now here's an interesting little segue that I'm going to give you. So uh, <laughs> the role-playing community, RPGs, role-playing gaming, right, has been actually incredibly supportive of people in all their shapes and forms for a very long time. Kind of interesting, this community has been actually a haven for a lot of people who maybe don't always conform to societal norms, right? Whether that's being trans or maybe they're autistic or maybe they're just playing geeky, right? I'm a geek and I love playing these games. So let me just explain for a minute. These role-playing games, and I'm talking about the ones that you do in person. I'll do a whole other sermon about online gaming because that's a whole fun thing. But um, I want to do about the ones you talk and do in person, which most of you have probably heard of Dungeons and Dragons, right? Okay, so Dungeons and Dragons is a game you play with a group of people, um, usually anywhere from about four to eight people or something like that in a small group. And basically you have uh, the players all create a character, right? And when they create a character, they do all sorts of things with this character, like what their name is, what their gender is, what their background story is, how old they are, what skills are they going to be a sword fighter or a magic user, you know? Like they, they choose all of these things, and it's done in kind of a structured sort of way. And then you have a dungeon master, okay? This is the person who basically builds an adventure scenario, and all of these players then go through the scenario and the dungeon master kind of controls the whole thing and you know, there's dice involved and chance and all this sort of fun stuff. Um, but it's fun, people get to role play different things, right? And the Dungeons and Dragons has been in fact really supportive 
of the trans community. The recent Dungeons and Dragons handbook, which is sort of their, their rule book, it says this. It says, you can play a male or female character without gaining any special benefits or hindrances. Think about how your character does or does not conform to the broader culture's expectations of sex, gender, and sexual behavior. You don't need to be confined to binary notions of sex and gender. You could play a female character who presents herself as a man, a man who feels trapped in a female body, or a bearded female dwarf who hates being mistaken for a male. So they're, in, they're encouraging people to explore all of this. So I was really excited when uh, Jeff Ayton, he's a member of this congregation, uh, decided that during COVID to start a role-playing uh, Dungeons and Dra Dragons group that we do online. And I started off with them, playing with them. It was a lot of fun. Uh, things just got really busy and I wasn't able to play anymore. But my niece, Alex, joined. Now, <clears throat> she joined long before she came out as trans, right? So here I am, her aunt and, and the minister, excited for her to join the group. And also, when she came out in February, I wondered how she was going to navigate the D&D group. So how tickled am I when Jeff, in June, sends me some really interesting articles about how role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons were helping people deal with gender roles and creating safe environments. So this whole sermon is actually in part because of Jeff. Now I have no idea if Jeff suspected that Alex was transgender or not, but I could have jumped through the computer to hug this man, <laughs> right? Just to know that Alex was in good hands, that she was welcome, just made me I'm like, Jeff, you're awesome. Ah, <laughs> oh, man. There's a, I found this wonderful blog by this woman named Amy Proudman. She wrote about how D&D &D helped her discover her gender identity. And she wrote this. She said, the freedom to explore gender didn't just come as an environment where it was encouraged, but also as a plausible deniability for what I was doing. So when she was also kind of struggling with it, like she could, like, well, maybe I'll just try this out, right? She says, there's no requirement to out myself while still entirely unsure about what gender meant to me. No need for me to sh bear my soul to people and hope they were accepting while I still didn't understand myself enough to identify as being trans. Instead, I was just playing a character. I was playing a man in real life. Why not a woman in my escapist life? While other players tried out different classes or races, I took the chance to shed the pretense of being a man and became someone else for a few hours without anyone questioning why. This steady stream of characters became chances to try out different ideals of gender that I felt. These characters provided me a chance to learn about how I related to the world and how I wanted to relate to the world. And she goes on, she says, it is important to stress that I would still be trans, even without D&D, &D, but without it, I could still well be that frightened young boy dreaming of the woman they long to be. All those characters in the games themselves played an important role in who I am and who I'm finally becoming. That was kind of amazing. So I wanted to talk to you about, a little bit about how these role-playing games create safe spaces for people to explore who they are, to feel supported, right? And one of example of these is what's called the X card, which was created by uh, a guy named John Stavropoulos. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, the X card is literally, it's just a three by five card with a black X through it, right? Okay. And basically, it allows participants in role-playing games who can use it to edit out anything that makes them uncomfortable with no expl excl explanations needed. Okay, it was developed to make gaming with strangers fun, inclusive, and safe. Okay, it tells everyone that people are more important than the game we're playing. So the thing about the X card is that while there's kind of an interesting thing, like you, you can use anything, it doesn't be a three by five card, it could be a sticky, it could be whatever, you can just use it. It really isn't about the card, it's about beginning a conversation because when you introduce it to the group, you might say something like this. I'd like your help to make this game or this group fun for everyone. If anything makes anyone uncomfortable in any way, just lift up this card. You don't have to explain why. It doesn't matter why. When we lift this card, it's, we simply edit out, edit out anything X-carded. And if there's ever an issue, anyone can call for a break and we can talk privately. 
I know it sounds funny, but it will help us play amazing games together. Please help make this game fun for everyone. Thank you. Like, okay. Now, when I heard this, I was a little bit like, how would this work? Like, would people feel comfortable doing this? Um, how, like, y y would people abuse it? Like, I'm just sort of wondering. And it turns out that actually the X card is used for all sorts of things. So, for example, it could be used for a trigger. Say you're, you're playing a game and maybe, like one, one guy I found online, he said he has PTSD. He's actually a game developer himself. He has PTSD and he uses the card if somebody brings up guns. It's just too hard for him um, to hear about that. Uh, some people bring it up if you want to stay with the story that and the, the realm. So like say you're playing a role-playing game where it's like modern horror or something like that, right? There's all different types of games. D&D is just one of them. So there's one modern horror, but somebody wants to bring in dancing elves, right? Like, okay, that's not really in line with the theme of this. So you can X card that. Uh, other things might be tangents. Somebody starts comparing the evil giant to an evil politician and then suddenly politics go off and you can X card and say, let's bring this back. And of course there's bullying, right? Someone maybe is teasing someone, oh, you're a girl, you know, or something like that. You can X card it. Now, like I said, if you're like me, I kind of was wondering about how would people do this, right? And as I mentioned, Jamie uh, Fristrom, he's a game developer, he talked about these challenges. He's the one who has PTSD, and he himself struggles with using the X card, but he still uses it. He said he's, the process can feel sort of cumbersome, and if a trigger happens, it's still out there. It's not like the trigger disappears, right? Um, he says sometimes he feels a little forced into conversations that can be kind of you know, huh, really? Um, so like, for example, if, if he X cards guns, people will be like, well, what about crossbows? Are, are lasers okay? You know, like, and you just start going, okay. <laughs> you know, um, so he, and he feels bad when he does it. Like, he does feel like, oh man, you know, am I a wet blanket? Um, he says, you know, and then feel people feel bad when they're X carded. Like, I said something wrong. Uh-oh, you know, what happened? Um, and he says the other problem is, is that you, are sort of required to a certain extent to be vulnerable, right, in a group. And that can be really hard, particularly if they're strangers, right? But like I said, he still uses it, but he kind of also does a lot of other things around that. First of all, he'll talk to a dungeon master ahead of time and tell him his challenges. So it's just one person instead of coming out to the group. If he's DMing, he'll invite people to say, if you've got any issues, please let me know. I'll make sure that, you know, I create a game that, you know, isn't gonna cause a problem. Um, he, he knows not to put himself in World War II RPGs. <laughs> you know, like he's like, I'm not gonna like suddenly make people like, you know, we're in World War II, but you can't use guns or tanks or anything. Um, now he wants to be part of the community, so he does these and he will just have those conversations. He knows that things, but there are other things that you can do. For example, he has what he calls an open door policy, which means if someone feels triggered, they say, hey, I need to go use the door. And they'll go outside to just take a few deep breaths and allow them to just come back. And everybody just holds the game for just a few moments while that person does it. You can give content warnings. Um, there's something called use of lines, like what's the line we don't cross? And I remember when Jeff was starting the D&D &D group, I, I didn't realize at the time he was asking me, what are the lines, right? Because he, I remember him asking like, well, c can we swear? <laughs> yeah, like he knows it's a church group, right? <laughs> I'm like, swearing is the least of my problems. But you know, he's not gonna do like full on gore or you know, anything like that. Um, so he knows there's a line there that he won't cross. So I was really struck by all of these really kind of creative ways to help make people feel welcome because oftentimes you do have strangers playing together, right? Um, because I was thinking about it, it's like that's what we try to do here at church, right, is to create a self, safe, welcoming atmosphere. We try to do two things here. We try to create a non judgmental supportive, compassionate, loving environment, right? Whether it's in worship or it's in small groups. We also try to create a courageous environment where people are courageous to listen to someone else's pain, right? That maybe we've done harm. Courage to speak up when you feel hurt. That takes a lot of courage and vulnerability to do that. And courage really for everyone to go outside their comfort zone. But the thing is, if you don't have the first, that safe environment, you're not gonna have the courage, right? It's too hard. So, 
you know, because we face some of those ch same challenges as a gaming community. Any community does. We're imperfect beings and we mess up. So remember forgiveness, right? Now, I'm the first person, like, we, like all of our opening words and songs was all about, you're welcome here, come in, we're welcome, right? I'm the first person to preach about being welcoming, right? That we try to widen that circle and to make sure everyone feels safe and comfortable and welcome, right? But I've been thinking about this, like, is this realistic? Is it even possible that everyone will feel welcome here? For example, we have a progressive social philosophy. That's not welcoming to everyone. For example, we recently said that we're going to require vaccinations for being at church activities, and that's not welcoming to everyone. There are clear tensions that we have between the individual, right, and the community, or between tradition and innovation, or rules and dogma versus plain chaos, right? On our job as Unitarian Universalists, it's not an easy one. We're trying to navigate all of these tensions. So let me tell you about one that I'm navigating right now. It has to do with Alex tangentially. I have a very dear friend of mine. Now this dear friend of mine, she's a, a retired Unitarian Universalist minister. We meet monthly as part of support for one another. And we have been through hell and back together. She's an absolutely wonderful, amazing person who has fought her entire life for women's rights and for gay rights. She's a generation older than me. Um, she's an absolutely amazing woman that I love and admire. And, I take a deep breath, she doesn't believe that trans women should be in women-only spaces. She's fine with them having trans spaces and she'll vote for their rights, but she doesn't want trans women in women-only spaces. And we recently got in a big argument about this, my mama bear coming out, and I started getting really frustrated, and we're going back and forth, and you know, we're not really listening to one another at all. And I finally, I said, okay, that's it. We're just not talking about this anymore, okay? And she said, no, 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 we have to talk about this. Please, I know it's hard, but please don't stop talking to me. And I remember her plea, it like just broke me open. And I said, you know what, Gal, you're threatening the future happiness of my niece. We're on the phone and I just hear this, oh. I felt like she heard me. I don't know if she's changing her mind or not, but she heard me. And I want you to know that I heard her pain too. I'm not going to recount it here as it's private and also because we have trans people in our congregation and I don't want to cause harm. But it did occur to me later that like we have this all or nothing kind of mentality sometimes. In other words, I think some women in her generation need to feel safe too. And it's, and it's unfortunate they don't necessarily feel safe maybe because they don't have the experience. Maybe they don't have those relationships to feel safe around trans women. But I'm gonna bet that there's gonna be a lot more spaces for my niece where she is welcome. Her generation is incredible and open and affirming. So maybe it doesn't have to be all or nothing. You know, King said, he said, true peace is not the absence of tension, it is the presence of justice. So I'm gonna riff off of King. True welcoming isn't the absence of disagreement, it's the presence of love. True welcoming isn't the absence of disagreement, it is the presence of love. When we say that we're welcoming to everyone, we aren't saying that people won't disagree or that we won't accidentally hurt someone. We're saying that we will do our best to create a loving, supportive, and safe environment for when we do disagree. That when love is present like it was between me and my friend, we won't stop the conversation. Because we are gonna disagree. But how we disagree, how we create safety for one another so we can hear someone another's pain is what we're trying to do here. And man, cultivating relationships can be hard, right? It is hard. I mean, I'm still learning from Alex and she's learning about herself. It's anything, we're all just growing. And communities, be they role-playing games or churches, are learning that they have a vital role to play in creating that welcoming place for people. Because ultimately, we value people. Not the game, not the music, not the sermon, the budget or the prayer, we value people.
may it be so, blessed be, and amen. Let us sing or sway. Our returning song is a new one to us, and I want to dedicate it to Alex and all those who have come out or have not even come out yet as trans or non-binary or anything along the gender spectrum. And tomorrow is coming out day, so let's celebrate all of those coming outs and the coming outs to be. <laughs> Unitarian Universalist congregations are fully self-supporting, meaning that members and friends all raise the funds for the operating budget, ministries, and programs of this church. We are ever grateful for your gifts of time, treasure, and talent. OCUUC amplifies that spirit of generosity by sharing half the plate we receive with an organization that shares our values. This month, we are supporting Alzheimer's Family Center. Alzheimer's Family Center provides memory care programs and caregiver support. They are locating, located in Huntington Beach. And if you would look, like to learn more about Alzheimer's Family Center, you can read about them on their website at afscenter.org. There are multiple ways in which you can support the church and this organization. You can mail a check. You can go through our website. Use an app now called Vanco Mobile. Or, if you are a roomer, you can place your offering in a basket as you leave the service today. The choice is yours. All the information is on our website should you need it. As always, thank you for your generosity.
All right, so Zoomers, please join in singing. Zoomers, please sway along to the song we sing every week. We gather together. This song puts our intentions into words and expresses our gratitude for the many gifts we share. We gather together, we gather as one for peace, love, and justice for everyone. We give from our hearts to show that change lives with what we share. Ah, uh, well now is that time when we honor important events and people in our lives and we're invited one and all, whether you're a member, friend, or visitor, to join us. This is Bertie Reed. She's one of our pastoral care associates and she's going to uh, help assist us here. Perhaps you're holding something close to your heart, moments from the last days, weeks, or hours, something that has struck you at your core. If you'd like to honor such a profound joy or sorrow, you are welcome to do so. So rumors, we have a little bit of a change. You are invited to come forward to light your own candle now. Um, so there you go. If you'd like to share your joy or sorrow, you can write it on a slip of paper. The ushers have those. If you, didn't, if you don't have one now, you don't have to write one on a slip of paper, but you can. If you'd like to share it with everyone, I'll read them out later. And if you're a Zoomer, you're invited to write your joy or sorrow in the chat. And uh, Bertie will also then light a candle for you. Um, once the rumors are done lighting their candles, I'll read the joys and sorrows out loud. And as this music is played, I invite you to silently offer healing or celebration as you feel called and according to your own beliefs. So I'll read those out on our chat on Zoom. So Amelia uh, would like a candle lit. She said we celebrated that uh, her mom's 96th birthday. That is cause for celebration. And Valerie Kay says, uh, please light a candle for me. Thank you so much. Linda Clough, she says, it's one of her great joys is to share this server, this service and, and time with her dear daughter, Valerie. And she said, I got to meet my new great granddaughter, Landon, last week. She's a sweet, sweet baby girl. Mm -hmm. 
Amelia um, said it was also with her extended family. It was a wonderful event. So Donna McCartney says her joy today is getting to know this church and the lovely people I have met. She says, thank you for being you, because you're awesome, right? Absolutely, Donna. And Matthew says, Joy last week uh, says, Alexander and I had our Jewish wedding ceremony in Balboa Park in San Diego. It was a perfect day. Congratulations. That is awesome. Uh, let's see here. We've got uh, Robin. Uh, she has both a fear and a sorrow. She says, please lift up my 17-year-old niece as she goes in for emergency brain surgery at Children's Hospital at noon today. Oh, my goodness. Hold her and her family in your hearts and send positive thoughts for the skill of the surgeons. Amen. <laughs> Dave Carlson, he says, a candle of thanks. He says, apparently God had a supply chain problem and had too many gallbladders about 80 years ago. I finally got rid of mine last week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dave, I love you, man. All right, um, let's see here. Bree uh, Ashurst, she says, I sent an email today requested to be officially, to be a part of this community and become a friend of the church. I look forward to participating in more activities with the church. Yay, Bree! That's awesome. She's my neighbor. I don't know if you know. Let's go. Yeah, she's cool. She's got two dogs, too. But anyway, uh, <laughs> Elizabeth uh, Kilshore, she says, please send healing thoughts for my 80-year-old mother who fell and shattered her hand. She is currently recovering from surgery. Oh, Elizabeth. Yeah, I hope that goes well, too. All right. I'm going to read these ones that were um, done here, and then Bertie will join me up here as well. She's, okay, so Meg Wilson, she says, a candle of hope. She says, I'm lighting this candle for the Wilson family, including my ex-husband, Brian. So we hold him and the whole family in our hearts. And those candles are already lit, Bertie. You can come on over. <laughs> And Marilyn lit a candle of joy, she says, for having a successful pacemaker implant this past Tuesday. She says, my heart has taken a licking but keeps on ticking. <laughs> and we're very happy it is. <laughs> and Sarah Jones has a candle also of hope. She says, um, her daughter-in-law, Alex, had emergency surgery on Friday. She was in terrible pain as they found gallstones and gangrene in her gallbladder. So they removed it. I don't know if she and Dave were in the same place, but please include her in your prayers and send her healing thoughts. We sure will. Absolutely. So let us hold in love all the joys and celebrations and all the hurts and sadness, whether they were spoken or held silently in our hearts. Let our joys remind us to be thankful, our concerns remind us to hope, and our sorrows remind us to connect. Let all these moments remind us that we are not alone. I invite you now to join Bertie in a spirit of prayer or meditation. Spirit of life, who draws us together in a web of holy relationships, make your presence known with us and in us and among us. Remind us that we are not alone in history. Ignite us with the courage of the living tradition. Remind us that we are not alone in entering the future. Anchor us with patience and perseverance. Remind us that we are not alone in our times of grief and pain. Comfort us with your spirit, manifest in human hands and voices. Remind us that we are not alone in joy and wonder. Inspire us to honor and extend the beauty we find in this world. Let it be so. Amen.
let us join together as we extinguish the flame of our chalice and say, we extinguish our chalice, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Thank you for joining us this morning. We are a congregation made up of all people who believe differently. And yet, when we gather together, whether we are in a room or on Zoom, we make up one loving community. We need not think alike to love alike. If you're a guest, a visitor, or someone who hasn't been yet known to us, I invite you to become a part of this beloved community. We encourage you to either write in the chat or stand for a brief moment and tell us your name and where you are from. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. We'll bring the microphone over and hold it for you so the Zoomers can hear your name, where you're from. Thank you very much. Welcome, Claire. Glad you're here. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. I don't see anybody on the Zoom chat, so welcome. If you'd like to know more about our church, including programming for our youth and children, please contact us at hello at ocuuc.org, and we will help you get connected. In addition, we invite you to sign up for our weekly email called The Blast at blast at ocuuc.org. We want everyone to feel a part of this beloved community, so please reach out and we will help you get connected. After the service, we will have a short period where everyone, roomers and Zoomers alike, can wave and say hello and welcome any visitors. The Zoomers who remain will be placed into Zoom breakout groups for 20 minutes. We invite you to check in and get to know the people in your group. All right, and of course there's announcements to be made of various things that are going on. Um, a couple things I want to say, uh, sermon discussion groups are starting I believe this week. Um, and we only have room left in our Tuesday evening groups. So they fill up really quickly, but if, you, if it's a great way to get to know people in the congregation, I highly recommend it. Basically, I give them an outline uh, of, the, of the sermon uh, because not everybody remembers, including me, what I actually spoke about. Um, so they have a little bullet points, and then there's questions like, what, you know, what do you think about this? What do you think about the X card? How would you use it? All that kind of thing. So uh, those are starting, so sign up those. The, you, there's, there should be a link in the blast for that. The big thing is that we've also got an all-church picnic next week. Yay, that should be a lot of fun. We're going to meet at Estancia Park, which is just down the road here on Adams on your right. Uh, that's going to be from 3 to 5. We're going to be outdoors, uh, so should be safe and all that sort of thing. So look for the blast as well for information about that. Um, the other thing is that we've got our great auction. The theme is a Charlie Brown Thanksgiving, <laughs> or a Charlie Brown auction, I guess, is actually what it is. It's not Thanksgiving, but uh, it's going to be on November 13th. Uh, I know last week I think that they sort of spoke about the, the auction and what to do. Uh, we need auction items and stuff like that. Like I usually do a sermon topic, so you get to choose what I preach on. You don't get to choose what I say, but you get to choose the topic, uh, <laughs> what I get to say on that. So, um, but I take you out to lunch and we chat and all that sort of thing. So there's things like that that you can do. People do dinners and fun excursions and things like that. It's a great fundraiser for the church. So I encourage encourage you to get involved in, in all of that. And of course, today, in celebration of our new relationships that we are cultivating with Reverend Liz and Reverend Judy, we have cake. So let's join Beth uh, and uh, singing our benediction. Remember, we choose people and choose to be brave. This service is over. Let our service continue. <laughs> 